Hello, everybody. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Thank you for choosing to spend your time with us today. My name is Trisha Howard, aka Trisha Kicks Sass, and welcome to the monthly threat brief, the SIG download. Bring on the madness. I am so excited to have our guest, Roger Veronco, on with me today. Hi, Roger. Hey, Trisha. Good to see you. <laughs> yeah, nice to see you too. How's it going? Going great, actually. Yeah, good. It's great. It's always great to see you. So I'm very excited to talk about, or I'm so excited to talk about you or talk with you always, but I'm really particularly excited uh, because we did have this kind of theme of like March Madness here in the U.S. is a gigantic event um, <laughs> for uh, for basketball. And it's also very uh, common for there to be a, a lot of work aspects of this, like tournament brackets and stuff within the corporations. Um, and so this kind of brings an interesting, an interesting light for security or a, a, an interesting problem for security people to solve. Right. Um, I saw a, a stat that, um, the, a estimated amount of money that is going to be uh, lost just due to March Madness is over fifteen billion dollars. So, as somebody who were in your role, like, what can you tell us about what you see? Yeah, you know, first of all, that number is pretty stunning. Uh, it sounds like you know somewhat along the lines of phishing, and so if you have those baseline controls in place. You're going to be better protected against those types of uh, hoaxes trying to induce you to go in and gamble on non-sanctioned type sites. But, you know, no surprise what this draws me back to operationally is, yes, you know, we're, we're super focused on the cybersecurity component, but there's a brother sister team called the MCO, you know, which is managed cloud operations that actually delivers much of the March Madness games over the internet. So we're able to have that combination of how's it going with delivering the content over the internet with how is it secured? Because if your organization or whatever you're doing is working very isolated, that creates a lot of problems, right? So you could imagine a day where you say, hey, you, you have the operational team engage the customer or whomever and say, hey, we're seeing these problems. But maybe they're seeing problems because of a security issue, which is why it's so imperative right. to lock those two groups together. Absolutely. Yeah, it, it's not one side's problem, right? And, when, and especially as things become more and more connected, we really have to be paying attention to this. I think it's a, it's a particularly interesting risk because it can affect obviously people themselves who are putting in uh, malicious or bets on malicious sites. But if they're doing it on their corporate computers, which a lot of them probably are streaming the games uh, at, during work hours, which we like to do as a part of a community building and all that kind of stuff, um, it brings in a very interesting um, weeks long threat. And I think this is, you know, very in a similar vein to what we've discussed with holidays where people are distracted and, and are have other priorities. That's like a short amount of time we're talking about an entire month and lead up to it and everything that this is uh that this is going on so it's a really interesting threat and sports in general uh i think are, are interesting when we're talking about a delivery versus security side um you know the big events they bring in a lot of money <laughs> they right bring in a lot of money mm, excellent so uh Real quick, let's talk about what happened in security in the last uh, few weeks. It sure has been um, a busy time. Um, there were we've talked about uh, nation states a lot on this show. Um, there was some really interesting nation state news uh, coming in. Of course, there was Microsoft was hit. Uh, there was some source code source code stolen. Um, another uh, Google ex Google engineer was uh, arrested for stealing uh, AI secrets for China. So, ugh, kind of big scary. Um, and then uh, there were some new novel attacks uh, that we saw a new DNS hijacking attack with uh, specific to investment scams, which was particularly interesting. And uh, my favorite, the acoustic attack, uh, which was determining keystrokes from different typing patterns, uh, which is really, really scary uh, to think that that can be how it works. But um, 
here we are. All of these links, of course, will be in the show notes. So you can check them out afterward. From an Akamai perspective, uh, we had some really cool, uh, inf uh, really cool research come out regarding Kubernetes. There was a local volumes vulnerability. Um, we had an NTLM credential theft uh, through Windows themes, which was kind of, was really, really interesting. I, I liked working on that piece a lot, um, as long as, or as well as a uh, net killer Condi. We saw CVE 2024-0778. Uh, one week after disclosure, we saw just a ton of exploitation of this. And this is a, a common thing where POCs are, are put out and then we start seeing them actually being used in the wild. And that time to it being exploited is shortening and shortening. So I would love to hear your thoughts on that, Roger, what you see in, in your role. Well, that was, that was a lot of really great information. Thank you for you know, sharing that. Uh, we'll have to talk more even after the show so I can learn more from you on you know the, the threat research and the cool pieces that are coming together. Uh, but you know, as I listen to these pieces, including the March Madness chunk of it, it makes me think about the basics of cybersecurity, right? And how a lot of times it, these simple things get bypassed. So um, the betting issue, at the end of the day, that goes to social engineering. Yes. Right, whether the phishing component and whatnot. So, you know, hey, does the organization have a plan in place to actually test? So, in my organization, once a quarter, we actually have attackers, social engineering attackers, go after the team to make sure that they are controlling PII and information properly. Because a plan mm -hmm. is just a plan until it's tested, right? You have to test these things and operationalize those components. But what's cool about what you're sh what you're saying? is it really highlights for me the importance of having a super tight relationship between the threat research arm and the security operations arm. Because yes. I, I see it a lot of times where you know the threat research side goes and they, they do magnificent work. They put an article out, but the step of how am I making these findings actionable from an operational perspective. So engaging operations and saying, hey, do we need a firewall change? Do we need an AI heuristic change? You know, what do we need to do to protect against that? Equally, you have security operations doing magnificent cyber things and not sharing that with threat research. So the I think the specific example I have is that, you know, I don't know how many people know this, but well over 500 times a month, Security operations is writing a custom rule or a custom signature to mitigate attacks. You could loosely tie that back to mitigating a zero day for that customer. So we make a distinct effort to take that information, share that up with the threat research side so that there's a collaboration between what's being seen on the front lines and the, tying it to the super cool stuff that Threat research is doing that's more forward leaning on yes. that and how to at the end of the day for both teams how do you operationalize that to protect the enterprise protect the individual yes. with yes. what's happening out there now i know it's really hard on the threat research side because you're so far ahead of the curve frequently that you that's find out bad. information that is um under moratorium you technically can't share it right so there might be a CVE that a month from now is going to be announced. You're aware of it with a very short list of other people right. giving you time to prepare for it so that a protection is already in place yep. when that CVE becomes announced. But even in that situation, you can't really talk too much about it, right? So how do yes. we just <laughs> plan at the end of the day to make it actionable? And to, to go a little deeper, we actually have a, a tool that we use called ATTR, which is actionable, timely threat research, right? Mm -hmm. Because at the end of the day, sometimes you need to respond as uncomfortable as it is when you only have about 60% of the information. Right. So that during right. an attack, there's fog of war. We're seeing a lot of different telemetry pieces. And mm -hmm. Are we comfortable in putting a mitigation in place? Because a mitigation should only mitigate bad traffic and not good traffic, right? That's a right. balancing act. To, to well, you don't in. want to break anything else in the process, right? And, yeah. and this is, I mean, the age old problem in security, which is patching, right? I mean, it's it's such a basic thing, but like, it's a, it's a real problem, right? Like trying to, trying to find time to, to make, 
to make this actionable and and put it into place where you were protected without breaking something else. You are you are spot on. So it's funny how uh, along those lines exactly. I'll, I'll talk to customers and you know we'll say, hey, you know, what is the number one victim region? You know, uh, from a cyber attack perspective, and in Europe in particular, that has ramped up dramatically since uh, the Ukrainian incursion and then uh, gone up even further with the challenges in the Israel-Palestine area. Uh, and so those things have jumped up. But when you look at source countries, where the attacks are coming from, yes, uh, Eastern Europe, uh, sometimes you know, Asia, that there are spikes of activity there, but very consistently on a mundane day, it's usually the US where those attacks are coming from. Why? It's not because the bad actors are there. It's because there are more unpatched machines there. So it goes back to where we started this off, right? Talking about the basics, social engineering, the yep. basics. Oh my goodness, please patch because please. that makes these problems frequently go away. Yes. Yes. Or at least sets you up well to make a plan in case something does happen. And I, I think that that's one of the, one of of the ways that threat research can be operationalized a lot is, is in this way. You mentioned something that I'm, I'm really glad that it came out of your mouth because I've said this a lot of times where uh, an, an interesting, an interesting uh, little funness we have in, in research is trying to remember the reality where we're, it's always on like what's coming tomorrow. That's what research's job is for, right? Research's job is what's going on now and what is what is coming tomorrow. But the enterprise is usually years behind. It takes a long time to make these changes happen, right? A long time. So trying to find, playing that balance, and I, I really would love your thoughts on this. Like, how what are your thoughts on the balance between doing stuff that is just really 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 cool that may not have a huge impact on the the organization versus like just what is happening like right now like cutting edge versus yeah. making it operational yeah so i think operationally you have to have a shared risk register that lists all of those things, no matter how future leaning and what the, and then you go back and do the very traditional risk scoring effort. And then you have yes. the operations team go ahead and implement those protections according to the risk scoring. Now, speaking of which, there's different methodologies for it. For what it's worth, I happen to prefer the NSA based risk scoring methodology, which is different mm -hmm. because it's more sensitive to what is important to the organization. Uh, oh. with respect for IT versus what's important to IT. So if you <laughs> go to, if you have to have this broad, you have to have all the different disciplines participate in the scoring action. Because if you just ask IT, they're going to run an internal scan and they should and find, you know, systems vulnerabilities. They're going to go, man, patching this, this server is, you know, two years behind. I have to patch that server right now. But what if that server doesn't contain any PII? It's not on the internet. It's locked into a DMZ somehow. That, you know, so that should deprioritize that in comparison with something that's front-facing your APIs, as an example, being the most sensitive thing that uh, most sure. levels are concerned with is API protection over other types of um, avenues into an organization. Yeah. Wow. Brilliant. <laughs> that's, that's such a good point. And, I, and this is something that I've harped on for years, which is making security realistic, right? We as security professionals, we understand like what the threat actually is, but we also have to take reality into consideration and you have to take in other priorities and you have to take in staffing and making sure you're not burning out your employees and and keeping a global mindset, which is something that uh, I, I know you and I've spoken about at, at quite at length. And so it can be very, very hard whenever you're focusing only on what's cool necessarily. You know what I'm saying? Right. You know, at the end of the day, you have to consciously select what you are not going to action. And oh. that piece is always, you know, frequently forgotten. And people feel like, wow, I've got this huge pile of alerts and actions and patches and everything else that must be done. Deep breath, put it in priority order and knock it out in order. It's it really and let go of the things you can't immediately control. Oh, wow. Well, that's just great advice in, for life, Roger, sure. honestly. And what a, I cannot believe that I'm about to say this, but we're already out of time. Oh. Uh, 
<laughs> it seems, it's never enough when I talk to Roger. Um, all right. Thank you, everybody. Just uh, I'm going to wrap up here. Thank you for spending your time with us today. Uh, our next episode is going to be on the 24th of April, springing into security. I'm going to have Steve Winterfeld on with me. It's going to be another great show. Um, you can see the attachments tab. We'll have all of the articles that were uh, discussed today. You can also check out our SIG page on Akamai.com and you can reach out to us directly on brighttalk at Akamai.com. We love feedback. Uh, we want to know, we want to make sure that we're giving you what you are looking for uh, whenever you come to the show. Uh, follow us on X as well for uh, real time updates on all of the cool stuff that we're working on. And Cybernara, y'all. See you later. Awesome. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Roger. Bye. Yeah, bye.